Am I? Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Stephen. If you're new here or uh, if you're visiting, a really warm welcome to you, but of course, a warm welcome to everyone that's here. And I believe a lot of us are on holiday. So if you're joining us online, maybe from holiday, then welcome to you as well. Um, one of the scariest things that can happen when you're in a relationship with someone is um, when, you, your part, when your partner, like you just come home and your partner says to you, hey, sit down, we need to talk about us. You know, and, and, you, and you start racking your brain for all the things that you might have done wrong. Did I, did I miss a birthday? Did I miss an anniversary? <laughs> um, did, I, did I not notice that she got a haircut or something like that? Um, you know, what do you mean? Like, what, 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 what is there to talk about us for? Um, I want to talk about us this morning, but not in a scary way. I want to talk about us um, because I want to talk about the way I think God wants to use each of us to serve Him and His church here at Kingsway. And I want to talk about this today particularly for a number of reasons. Firstly, because we're celebrating the 36th anniversary and, and if we're celebrating the church's birthday, what we're really celebrating is that we're celebrating 36 years of the unique way God has brought together different people to, to be in one place, in one community. We're here because of the way God has brought people to be committed to His church. But secondly, I want to talk about this today because, you know, we're in a stage of life um, here at Kingsway where, you know, most of us know Kingsway has undergone pretty significant change in the last year and a half, bringing in a new minister, a.k.a. myself. And when things change, you know, change shakes things up and change exposes areas of need that we might have taken for granted and times of change, when that happens, it can bring about a different energy. You know, we're like, you know what, I should do something about it. There's these gaps that I can see. It motivates us. And for me, I've seen that happen, you know, coming to Kingsway. People have been involved in the ministry of the church. But I think a year and a half on, I think we have to also recognize that sometimes the adrenaline that comes from having change is going to wear off. So I want to talk about the way God calls each of us to be a part of His community. And I truly believe the vision that we all must have for our church is to want to see people, is to want to see ourselves, is to want to see people who have different personalities, different gifts, and even different capacities. We want to see everyone empowered to live a life that's governed by what Jesus has done for us and therefore what Jesus has called us, called us to be. And so what I really want to do when I say I want to talk about us, what I really want to do is to encourage all of you from God's Word, to encourage all of you to know that through Jesus, God has specifically made you a part of his church here at Kingsway. And because he's done that, it's your right to receive and to be blessed by and to be loved by others in Christ. But at the same time, he's also called you to a responsibility to learn, to give, and to bless and love others in Jesus as well. So here's how I'm going to tackle tackle this. We're going to look at the two chapters through three headings. We're going to talk about spiritual gifts, talk about being members of the body, and then we'll talk about our pursuit of love. Let's pray. Father, we give you great thanks that, um, yeah, 36 years is a long time for the church, but uh, you're eternal, and we are so glad that um, 36 years, one year, one day, um, for you, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. We want to celebrate this, but we want to celebrate it by basing ourselves on, on the unchanging truth of your word. So please speak to us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Um, you know, I, I want to talk about spiritual gifts a little bit, but I'm not going to be talking about, look, you know, tongues and stuff like, you know, uh, you know what, what, what sort of miracles that you're going to do or what sort of prophecies you have. Uh, that's not my focus today, so I'm sorry, but I want to talk about something much more simple, something much more basic regarding the nature of spiritual gifts, as Paul says here. He says, um, he says look, there's lots of different types of gifts, but they all come from the same Spirit. And to everyone, the Spirit has been given uh, for the common good. Uh, someone gets a message of wisdom, someone gets a message of knowledge, another faith, uh, another gifts of healing and gifts of prophecy, distinguishing spirit, speaking of tongues. And he says all of these are given by the Spirit for the common good. Meaning, every Christian has been uniquely gifted and uniquely prepared by God to allow them to serve God's common good. And, and the common good that Paul is speaking about is more than just you know, charity in the world. Uh, every Christian is uniquely gifted by God for the common good of the church, i.e. the work of building up His church to help the church live out its mission of being a Christ-centered and God-glorifying community. God has uniquely gifted each and every person by His Spirit to do that. And, and the best way to understand what that looks like is by looking at the example of Jesus. When we look at Jesus, Jesus' overarching mission in coming to the world was to bring God's people into the fullness of their identity of, of, of being a Christ-centered, God-glorifying community. God says, you will be my people and I will be your God. And Jesus achieves that through the gospel. See, the gospel is the good news that Jesus, the Son of God, was born, He lived, He died, He was raised from the dead, He's ascended into heaven and He's going to come back. And anyone who believes in Jesus, anyone who repents of their sin by grace, through faith, is regenerated, that they're given a whole new humanity, a whole new identity in Jesus. We're supposed to live out this new newness of life. Jesus comes as the pioneer, Hebrews says. He's the pioneer of a new humanity. And if Jesus is the pioneer of a new humanity, then Jesus' call for all of us is for us to live out that new humanity to live out the gospel every single day. And if we sort of try to tie that in with, okay, well, Paul's talking about spiritual gifts. What, what does it mean that God has gifted us, each of us, uniquely to, to be able to live out that mission? Um, I want to categorize the way that Jesus lived out his mission of bringing God's people into the fullness of, um, of living out the gospel, of following Jesus, um, I want to categorize Jesus' life into sort of three roles that Jesus fulfilled. Jesus fulfills three roles. The, he, Jesus comes as a prophet, Jesus comes as a priest, and Jesus comes as a king. In other words, Jesus comes to speak to us in God's word as a prophet. He also comes to rule over us as a king does, but he also gives his life in service to us as a priest does. And so when we are united to Jesus and we become his followers, we take on these roles in our personal lives, in our families, in the world, and particularly in the church, we become prophets, priests, and kings. We become people who speak the word to each other. We become people who, who exercise godly authority in the roles that God has given to us, and we become people who serve one another. And, and every single Christian is called to be that. Every single Christian is called to be a prophet and a priest and a king in some way. We, we are, every single one of us is called to disciple each other, to speak the, the truth in love to each other, to, to care for each other. It's a necessary response from all of us to Jesus and His gospel. But of course, the chapter today tells us that not everyone is equally gifted in each role. 
Some shine brighter in the way that they show mercy and care. Some shine brighter in the way that they teach. And, and others excel in, in administration and management. We have different personalities, different gifts, and even different capacities. The Bible recognizes all of that, but within all of that, it still calls us to this really great mission of following Jesus ourselves and helping others follow Jesus. That's the common good. And so for us, here at Kingsway, that means that we should want to be a church that recognizes the unique ways God has gifted each of us. And to do that, we need to work hard at building an environment and a culture and a community where people could, you know, one hand, discover their gifts, but also have a space to use their gifts appropriately. That, that begins from, of course, myself and the elders and, and the way we speak and model things, but it also begins from the smallest way each of us interacts with each other. How do we speak to each other? Do we have a willingness to have spiritual conversations with each other? Uh, do we, are we open with, with praying for each other? We're we saying, look, what, what's God done that we can be thankful for? What is God doing in our lives? Do we find opportunities to help encourage someone else to praise God for what He's doing? And, and you know, I'll be honest, when I think about look, spiritual gifts and, and you know, we need to have people serving and things like that, I, I, it's very tempting for me to sort of um, simply ask people to join a ministry team. You know, hey, hey, you should join the welcoming team and you should do this and you should do that. Or, you know, join or put your name down on a roster. And it's tempting for me to say that because that makes me personally feel like I'm doing something to get people on board and, and I'm seeing names on rosters and things like that. Um, so on that note, look, if you've been at Kingsway for a while, you know, consider joining one of the ministries. Look, there's, there's a lot that you can do. Um, I won't go through it all there, but, but here's a little snapshot um, of areas that you might serve. There's things that aren't on there as well, like community pantry. But, but as, as much as, you know, look, yeah, talk to me, talk to someone if, if you want to join a team, but serving others and being a part of the body of Christ, of course, isn't defined by joining a team. I want you to, but that's not what this sermon is about. Serving others isn't about joining a team, but it is about living out the gospel. Serving others isn't about joining a ministry team, but it is about a heart change. It is about repentance because the way we live out our Christian life in relation to others, the way we use our spiritual gifts to build up God's church for the common good, all of that is essentially about a response in our hearts and in our lives to the fact that God is in an ongoing relationship with you and He calls you to follow Him, which therefore means that God is calling you to also help others to follow Him. So what I'm really asking you to consider is I, I want you to consider and I want you to recognize how massive the gospel is. I, I'm asking you to consider how important each of you are to the work of the gospel here at Kingsway. Now, all of us are important members of one body. Now we like to think about ministry you know, the word ministry is directly linked to the word minister, you know, and so we think, oh yeah, the ministers, yeah, 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 that's what we, that's what we pay you to do, we pay you to do ministry, um, you know, you, the, we put the ministers on the front line, they, they go out and they do ministry and, and, and the church, we're just here to support the minister, but I actually think it's the other way around, the minister uh, the church isn't there to support the minister to do ministry. The minister is here to support the church so that the church can do ministry. It's actually the church that should be at the front line, isn't it? The ministry of pastors is to equip the church to do ministry. In fact, if we just 
simplify it. At the end of the day, ministers are just people from the church who God has given particular gifts to build up God's church in a particular way. And so the ministry of the minister is to serve the ministry of the members. And by members, that's all of us here. No, I thought, you know what, look, it's the church's anniversary and I'm going to talk about members and I'm going to use the word members. So um, I thought, you know, why not? Why not just take this opportunity to define what a member is? Um, I, and I, this is something that I've been thinking about and, and something that the elders have been thinking about, but um, I want to give you a bit of a technical definition of what a member is in the light of... We're in the Presbyterian church and if you, you, may, you may or may not know the Presbyterian church church has like a whole book called The Code that lays out everything that the church is and um, isn't and should do and shouldn't do. Um, And this is how it defines members and and it tells us about two different types of members. Uh, It's semi-important. I I think it's a good opportunity to talk about it because there's no no other time to talk about this. The first is a communicant member. Um, The communicant member is a baptized person, that's actually a key difference, is a baptized person who comes to church regularly and who's added by the session to be a communicant member. There's a specific, okay, you're a communicant member sort of resolution that we do. Uh, And communicant members have the right to take, obviously, full part in the life of the church, voting in everything, and communicant members alone, the code says, elect elders and ministers. So, Leon, you may, there's two slides for each, so I I may have missed one, but um, that's the first type of member. The second type of member is the adherent member, and adherent is a person who, just like the communicant, comes to church regularly, but it doesn't have to be a person who's baptized. Adherents have the right to do everything pretty much a communicant does, except They don't have the right to vote to call a minister. In other words, they don't have the right to be involved in deciding who the minister is going to be. They have a right to agree to it and say, look, yeah, we agree, but that's not what they're allowed to do. So they're very similar, and there's really no... You know, like, oh, if you're an adherent, you're not serious sort of thing. Um, everyone who's, who comes to King, Kingsway is automatically an adherent, unless you're, like, new or a visiting. And anybody who becomes baptized or confirmed in the church or comes from another church and, and is a communicant of another church and, and, and transfer their membership to our church is a communicant of the church. I think it's important because not that communicant and adherent like necessary that that's the most important thing, it, but I think it is important to think about our membership in the church. You know, we have a baptism class. We call it a baptism class. I'm actually probably going to change the name to not a baptism class, but a membership class because I think membership is actually the more important thing. You, 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 when you're baptized, you become a member. And um, what I also have, just for fun, is um, I've printed out everyone's name and whether they are a communicant or adherent. So if you've been coming to church for a long time and you assume you're a communicant, you may not actually be a communicant. And if that happens, you may not have the right to vote to call a minister and the reality is, at some point, you're going to have to call me because I'm, I'm on a contract. And so if you want to call me as a permanent, then you're going to want to be a communicant to either say yes or you're very welcome to say no <laughs> as well. Um, so I, I, I'll have these. You can find me um, during morning tea or maybe I can give one to one of our elders, Henry, and you can have a look as well. Okay. All this to say, look, you don't have to be a communicant to belong at church. You don't have to be a communicant to be welcomed. You don't have to be a communicant to be saved. You don't even have to be a communicant to to take part in the Lord's Supper. 
And of course, you don't have to be a communicant to be a part of the life of the church to serve. But it's important for us. It's important to think about our membership in the church. And like I said, it's important because being a member of the church defines for us our rights and our responsibilities. Each, as members of the body, each part of the body has a right to be loved and cherished as part of the body. And each part of the body has a responsibility to love and cherish other parts of the body. Now, Paul says, look, um, God has placed... God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as He wants them to be. There's many parts, but one body, and one part of the body, the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, Paul says, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are actually indispensable. The parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. The parts that are unpresentable, we, we, we treat with special modesty. Our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, and so that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. I mean, mean, that's applicable to us as Kingsway, but it's also applicable to us in the light of the fact that we are part of a larger church body in IPC as well. Now, being a member of the church gives us a right to be loved and served by others, but also gives us the responsibility to love and serve others in Christ. So here's my encouragement to you all. Please, live out your rights and responsibilities. Participate in gathered worship every Sunday. Because that's where... That's where we speak and sing and and pray for one another. Live out your rights and responsibilities by finding ways to meet together, to invest in each other's lives, to invest in the way that people are walking with Jesus. It doesn't have to be every week. Uh, You don't have to be best friends, but whether it be life groups or one-on-one or even just going out for a meal together or, or just a quick chat and a quick prayer, Find ways, find the unique ways that God has gifted you to generously meet the needs of others, whether that be uh, relationally or physically or spiritually or even financially. Help them to follow Jesus. Live out your rights and live out your responsibilities. And his thing, just as much as it's important for you to do that for others, please commit to making it as easy as possible for others to do that for you as well, for others to love and serve and care for you. Okay, Um, a little short on time. Um, I want to end with a final point. And the final point is that Paul gives us this warning. Paul gives us a warning that um, when we think about like serving and doing things and living out our rights and responsibilities, there's actually a trap. And the trap is that we think that our place at church is actually defined by our gifts and how we use them. But Paul's ending argument is that our gifts, the way we serve, the way we volunteer, doesn't define us. It's not our gifts that define us, but actually Paul says what defines us is our fruit. You know, he says, look, everyone has gifts. Desire the greater gift. I'm going to tell you the most excellent way. And then he says, if I speak in all these tongues, if I I have the gift of prophecy, if I have faith that can move mountains, if I have everything, but if I don't have love, Paul says, I'm nothing. You know, the sort of attitude that when we come to church and we say, look, here's all the things that I should do or I can do and I want to do. If that doesn't have love, if it's not actually fueled by love, then there's a couple really bad problems 
that arise from that. First of all, the problem that arises is that church becomes a personal stage for me to live out how good of a person I am. You know, I'm so good at this, I'm so good at singing, or I'm so good at you know, managing people, I'm, I'm so good at this or that. And if I don't get to do that, then the church is stifling me. I'm leaving because the church doesn't love me. Or we could say, look, I have this gift. I know I have this gift. I know I'm good at this. And therefore, I'm just going to do it and I don't care what you think. I don't care what you need. I'm just going to do me because I know that this is my gift. But, of course, that's not actually very loving at all. You know, the, the, there's another problem that comes with this where we think that because I have this gift, that's what the church needs to focus on. You know, we say things like, you know, you know when I see it, this is the problem with our church. Uh, this is the problem. People aren't generous enough. They don't give enough to the community pantry. Or, hey, this is the problem. Uh, people aren't doing enough evangelism. They don't care about people who aren't Christian. Now, the problem is that people aren't sacrificial enough. There's not enough money. Now, all of those may or may not be true because all of those things are important aspects of following Jesus. But to speak in that way, to have that attitude, is an attitude that's not governed by love, actually, but more likely it's an attitude governed by what we like and what we think our gifts are, and therefore what we think everyone should do. And if we do that, we end up confusing spiritual gifts with spiritual fruit. Spiritual gifts are what you do, but spiritual fruit is what you are, and Paul says you can have all of the spiritual gifts. You can do everything. But that might not actually change what you are. And Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, you know, I did this for you. I, I went and prophesied. I, um, you know, I, I, I drove out demons. I performed miracles. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, you know, I'm going to tell you I never knew you. You know, spiritual gifts are not the end. They're just a means to an end. The end is spiritual fruit. And the end is spiritual fruit because the end is Jesus. The end is Jesus who bears fruit in ourselves and in others. The end is Jesus because Jesus' mission is for people to take on and live out their new humanity in Him. So for us, to love, for us to serve, for us to really be members of God's church, for us to be involved in the ministry of God here at Kingsway, then we need to be in tune with Jesus. And it's only by being served by Jesus, by knowing that Jesus rescued us from sin and death, that He left behind His natural gifting. He left behind His natural position of authority. He left behind all the things that he could boast about to come and meet us in our need. If, if we can really be captivated by Jesus so that our greatest desire is to be more like Jesus and, and to help others be more like Jesus because we see in Jesus someone whose love is greater than any praise that we could receive. It's greater than any, any self-affirmation I can do, I can give to myself for, for doing a good job. If we can see that Jesus met our greatest need in exactly the way we needed it because He loved us, then I believe we can fully enjoy our rights and fully live out our responsibilities as a church. We can go down the most excellent way of love and be freed to serve. Let's pray. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit over time. Father, we thank you for your word, for speaking the truth to us about who we are and, and who we are in Jesus and what Jesus has done for us and how that empowers us to live out our identity 
in the gospel. Uh, We ask that you would do that in each and every one of us, and as you do that in us individually, we know that you're going to do that to us as a church, that we can spend another 36 years uh, honouring you and proclaiming you to Sydney and beyond. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.